Catherine, I'm just off the air. I've had a crazy day because we were covering breaking news where, in case you haven't seen the alerts on your phone, Iran has sent about 200 missiles across to Israel. We were watching them explode. Can you imagine a scenario where it's now AI controlling this and the ways that changes what is already a situation that is fraught with instability and uncertainty? Absolutely. You know, AI has the potential for such tremendous good and it's being used uh, for a lot of good, but it also has some real dangers that come with it. And one of the ways in which AI can be dangerous is with a kind of asymmetrical capability uh, for issues relating to uh, conventional weapons or, as we call it, CBRN, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weaponry, and the ability to put into a non-state actor's hands, for instance, uh, the capability to do all kinds of mischief. Um, so I can see AI having uh, some issues with uh, uh, creating a, a kind of instability. But I also know that a lot of companies are working hard on trying to keep things safe. But, but there's also this equalizer. If you consider the power and the might of the United States, President Biden had ordered the US military to come to Israel's defense and to shoot down the missiles. Uh, uh, normally, you would think that, that's, that the, the power and the might is on the side of the US and Israel. But even if the UN comes forward and says, all right, we're going to get all the signatories to get around the table and sign an AI agreement the way they have about chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, there are non-state actors does it equalize them in terms of power and might? Well, it doesn't. I wouldn't say it equalizes them because the might of uh, the United States is tremendous. The might of Israel is tremendous. The might of many states is uh, really extraordinary. But what it does do is it can provide information and access uh, to capabilities in hands that have never had that kind of uh, capability before. Uh, it does, so it, I wouldn't say it equalizes it, but it does raise the possibility uh, that we can have a, uh, a real catastrophic situation on our hands with non-state actors. So I cover insurance and casinos, but, but insurance is already using AI to assess risk on lots of different lines, uh, supply chain, um, they're looking at climate risk, they're looking at geopolitical stability and using AI. How can companies use AI and, and manage their own risk or the risk of AI itself? Right. Companies today, in terms of managing their own risk, are putting a, a variety of AI systems, depending on the company, uh, in place to be able to, for instance, uh, with companies that have huge infrastructure in the oil and gas industry that will measure certain kinds of events that may occur that may result in uh, a meltdown or a breach or uh, a gaseous um, uh, emission or something like that. So there's a lot of utilization of AI in terms of infrastructure. So they can use that to help manage their risk. But they can also uh, have AI inside of the company that can create its own risk. Uh, and what they've got, to, in other words, they can bring AI in thinking it's going to do only good. And the AI can have a back door open into a cyber, uh, a cyber risk or something else. And so companies are putting in place a lot of safety checks to help them uh, understand when risk events may be triggered, what the risk surface is for the company itself. They've got to understand what the risk surface is, and then therefore what the mitigations would be to that risk surface. Now does every board member need to be an AI expert? Does every entrepreneur have to be an AI expert in order to have those guardrails in place? Well, not you know every board member doesn't need to be an AI expert by any means, but the board members really uh, do need to understand first of all, what the use cases might be for their company in terms of AI so they can then get a report uh, from the people who are most knowledgeable on what the risks are 
uh, that their company may be facing. So the first question is, how are we using it? Are we using it? Number two, uh, what are the risks? Number three, do we have the right people who are uh, managing those risks for us? And four, have we had any incidents that I, a board member, ought to know about in terms of experiencing uh, a, a real sort of uh, actualization of those risks. Can't can you just ask AI, please tell me all the cases where my employees have used AI inappropriately? Well, you know, AI can do a lot of reporting on employees, and that kind of uh, surveillance is not very well, uh, a lot of folks don't like that. Um, but AI is being used increasingly uh, in terms of different kinds of reporting for metrics um, for businesses on employee conduct. Um, and it can be everything from ensuring that there isn't theft uh, to uh, there aren't cyber events uh, and that people are acting appropriately. But those are often quite controversial. Uh, they are similar to the utilization of AI for purposes of other kinds of surveillance in mostly governmental realms. The EU has passed now its AI bill uh, law and we'll see that implemented over the next couple years. Uh, what do companies need to know about complying with that? And I'm, I mean, so many of the AI companies are based here in the United States. Will the US regulation end up setting the precedent for the rest of the world? Well, uh, and so there's a couple of questions uh, embedded in, well, explicitly uh, stated there. Let me sort of go to the EU AI Act first, which is the EU AI Act has a very significant compliance regime that sort of uh, could be uh, required of all kinds of companies that are doing business in or that impact uh, the EU. And so it will have worldwide implications, sort of like the GDPR for those who are familiar with the privacy regulations. Um, one of the things that's going to happen is that large companies will be assessing how do we comply with what the EU AI Act is asking us to do. Uh, if we've got a high-risk business or a high-risk use case for the AI, what does that mean? But for smaller companies, uh, it's gonna be a real lift because, and it may actually present some real issues for uh, small companies to comply because of the amount of paperwork that's gonna be required, keeping uh, copies of all of the training sets whenever there's a material change in parameters. So it's going to be a uh, a real issue. In terms of the US setting sort of the stage for things, we're behind in terms of worldwide regulation, but the United States, when people ask me, is AI actually regulated? It's not regulated, is it, in the United States? I always say, look, we have the common law. The common law applied 200 years ago and it continues to apply. It's a very flexible doctrine. You can use the common law to apply to all kinds of incidents that could occur with regard to AI. So don't forget <laughs> that the uh, common law exists. And so the US is not leading the way in terms of worldwide um, regulation, but it is, it's got lots in place here domestically. If the US passes stringent AI standards, are you concerned that it actually could cripple innovation and, and damage our ability to lead on the technology front? You know, I think that chilling innovation is a real risk with certain kinds of regulation. And it ought to be a concern and often is a concern to regulators when they're uh, seeking to pass regulations. How will this really impact the American businesses that give jobs to American citizens and then the jobs create the money that makes the world go around, right? These are real issues, which is why most regulations are put out for public comment for a period of time and go through another process. But the one, one of the issues really right now is that if regulation becomes so stringent that it is difficult for companies to comply or they choose not to stay in business in the United States, we may see companies choosing to put their AI training elsewhere, to put their AI processing elsewhere, to put their AI development elsewhere, because uh, you know the regulatory environment could become tough. We just don't know yet. I, I, I want to mention that you formerly were with the Department of Justice as a prosecutor uh, and that you were a judge. If you, I mean, you have just three minutes here, but if you were able to talk to American business 
and give them the benefit of your vast experience boiled down into three minutes, what would it be when it comes to AI? <laughs> what I would say is that um, this is not hype. AI is not hype. It's not going to affect every single business in the same way. So people who were waiting for AI to monolithically transform American business in the same way and are disappointed because it hasn't absolutely transformed their world, calm down. It's going to get to you. Um, and uh, what you need to do, though, is assess what's the competition doing. Don't get left behind. Make sure that you, your, you and your business have the right structures in place to be able to put AI into the business, be able to put compliance regimes uh, around that, uh, that you are able to then understand what the global framework is for your business if you are seeking to go global, because it won't be the same outside of the US as inside of the US. Make sure your board is informed. You know, People do not want to forget that the leadership of a company needs to be uh, made aware and kept aware of how AI is being used. Ensure that you've got a common definition of AI across the company. One thing I see frequently is there's a, about 27 different definitions of AI in a company with about 15 different units. And that's a problem because everybody then is regulating to a different definition. So I would say to an American company or to any company, uh, keep up with what's happening. Uh, this is the most transformative moment. And I'm old enough to know about a lot of transformative moments. One more that might transform AI as we know it. Could AI end up having legal rights itself? Well, you know, the, I, uh, I actually wrote an article on sort of legal personhood and AI. I and, read it. That's why I asked okay. that question. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It's a planted one. Um, and I think that it'll depend a lot on the development of AI. You know, we have in this country um, had given legal rights to corporations, which are on paper only. You know, so it's not. And we've given First Amendment rights to corporations. Uh, we have given search and seizure, Fourth Amendment protections to corporations. So having non-human things have rights. I think is not new. But what is new is the asset, the AI asset, would be owned by somebody else or something else, a corporation. So giving that rights within rights, that becomes really quite complex. I think there will be ethical issues that can arise. There already are some ethical issues in terms of human alignment and moral issues that could arise if AI reaches this magical point of, uh, you know, our uh, true um, sort of situational awareness. When's that going to happen? I think in about 18 months. Okay. <laughs>